Good morning, everybody. Today we're going to study from Unit 2, Facing Life's Obstacles, and we're going to go over uh, reading one. So you already watched the video at home and already did the activities in your textbook, textbook reading and writing, Unit 2. And so today we're going to review the results of your work and this is the time where we review the material you can ask questions you can share uh ideas opinion um you can say what's on your mind you can also ask about your project this is the time for you to ask and to speak up because everybody can hear and everybody can learn also from what you have to say yeah um please remind me if i forget something if something has been unclear i will re-evaluate and explain it to you okay first things first here we see uh the picture of these uh guys playing basketball they're probably in high school and uh either junior or senior high school uh, what we can see is well the game is just a normal game it's by the way a nice place uh but these guys cannot use their legs so they're playing basketball from a wheelchair which is extraordinary it shows uh amazing strength and uh perseverance yeah not giving up. And that's what we're talking about in this unit, right? Obstacles, not facing obstacles in life and how do we deal with that? Now, we, so we are going to go to a reading one, The Education of Frank McCord, a very interesting story about uh, the life of this man. Now, before we do that, we're going to jump really quick into your um, vocabulary just to make sure you got that one right so please go with me to page 262 262 and here we see the word list these are this is your vocab uh, per unit and remember that for reading and writing uh you have to use the vocab and grammar in your um in your writing in your journal in your in your essay and also in um it will come back into your unit test and for and the same is for listen, listening and speaking. The vocab and grammar for listening and speaking will come also into the unit test and should be used in your speaking test, right? In your log. So we've got abandonment, accountable, defeated, dilapidated, gives up hopelessness, laborious, meager, misery, poverty, self-reliant, shame, sordid, struggles, romantic, and yearn for. And for the grammar, always look at the first column, guys, not on the second and third, just on the first. We're looking at gerunds and infinitives. Um, that is for uh, this unit, okay? Um, we will get there when we get to focus on speaking, uh, focus on writing on some beans. Okay, that brings us back to where we were just now, page 36, guys. Awesome, so here we are, vocabulary. Uh, as you know, the bold face words are the words that we're studying. So today we're looking at abandonment, we're looking at meager, we're looking at misery, yearn for, tormented, dilapidated, poverty, hopelessness, shame, sordid, and defeated. And here are the words in context, uh, which would definitely help because by looking at the context, you might already be able to figure out what the meaning of the word is. So this is called words in context. Now, having read that, uh, we're gonna answer three questions. These are like more general questions of, about the text, but they give us insight on the text and what it means. And it helps us work with the text and with the words in context, the vocabulary in context and figuring out what this means. Now, number one, Frank had a hard life growing up. What were some of the obstacles or challenges that he had to overcome? Now, I'm going to, um, uh, what is that? Wait, I'm going to open your names. I forgot. So I can, uh, otherwise I end up asking questions uh, to the same person. <laughs> and that is not so nice. Um, Okay, so we're going to start with, oh, here we are. Uh, Adisha, 
Uh, Dishia, Laura, good morning. Morning, Miss. Hi. Uh, can you answer for me number two and three? So we've got uh, number two, three. Number one, I mean, Frank had a hard luck growing up. What were some of the obstacles or challenges he had to overcome? And by the way, is there anyone who would want to help me volunteer for annotating the answers? Who can annotate for me? Anyone? No? I'm sorry, miss. I can't right now. I'm yeah. using my phone. Oh, oh you're so. using your phone. Okay. Anyone else? Maybe? No? Okay, then I will do it then. Okay. No problem. Okay, so what's the answer? His father could not earn enough money. Frank's siblings died as babies. His father abandoned him and his house was small, dirty, and very cold in the winter. Very good. Okay, now I'm going to put in. Yeah, that's the correct answer. Thank you. I write it in a shorter version, otherwise it doesn't fit. Awesome. Okay, what did Frank enjoy doing as a child? I'm going to ask Serafim. Good morning, Serafim. Yes, miss? Can you answer number two? Uh, read the question. Uh, just give the answer. Okay. Number two, reading books. Yeah, he enjoyed reading. Okay. Uh, yeah, he enjoyed reading very much. Okay, thank you. Number three, why did Frank reinvent his past when he came to America? Anyone who would like to try? No? Okay, then I go to Aldi. Okay. Aldi? Yeah, yeah, miss. Hello? Yep, can you answer, please? Okay. Because he was ashamed by his past. Yeah, that's uh, very correct. Thank you very much. He... Can I read it? He was ashamed of his past, yeah. That's really sad, though. I mean, like, we shouldn't be ashamed of our past, yeah? Like, that's so super sad. Oh, yeah. wait. Oh, wait. Oh, confusing. Oh, okay, that's like that. Yeah, so he was ashamed of his past, and that was the reason why he, uh, yeah, he, he didn't really want to talk about it, and he even reinvented his past. Means he, he spoke of it differently. That's not nice. Okay, we're going to go to the next part, uh, activity three. So we looked at the words in context. We tried to answer questions with those words in context. And now we're going to look for the correct synonym uh, connected to the word. So misery. So is a, sadness is a, mis is a misery. <laughs> sadness is a uh, synonym to misery. Okay, um, I would like to ask how do we do this. Back. Vincent. Dicky, okay, um, wait, wait, wait. Wulan, good morning, Wulan. Hi, Miss. Good morning. Hi, can you answer number two and three for me? Number two, I think, is dilapidated. Number two, a bit different, though. Number two is meager, means poor and sparse. What do you think uh, number three is? you have any idea what number three is? Embarrassment? Shame. Yeah. Miss? Yep. 
Miss? Yes. Um, what's the difference between meager and poverty? The difference between meager and? Poverty. Ah, I'll get there later, yeah? When we okay. get there, that's a very good question. Yeah, very good. We'll get there in a bit. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Pratnya. Yes. Okay, can you do four and five? Um, four is defeated. Mm -hmm. And five is year four. Yeah. Very good. Okay, now we go to uh, six and seven. Um, I'm gonna ask Abdi. Abdi, good morning. Abdi, no Abdi. If I am thing, not a yeah. Okay. David. David. Okay, we go to Nicole. Yes, miss. Hi, can you do six and seven? What's painful? Uh, number six is tormented. Mm -hmm. Number seven is sordid. Yeah, sordid. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, Raihan. Yes, miss. Can you do number eight and nine? Number eight and nine. Um, having little money is poverty, miss. Yeah. And then leaving someone behind is abandonment. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Now we go to 10 and 11. Um, Virgin? Yeah, miss. What is 10 and 11? Number 10, hopeless. Number 11, defeated. Dilapidated, yeah. Okay, cool. So these are the words uh, in context with the synonyms, yeah? Okay. Any questions about this? No? So we got the words in context, uh, understanding the text, but looking at the words in context and finding synonyms for words. It's very important, guys, to know a lot of synonyms because it'll help you for, for your writing and your speaking, yeah? Because in academic English, you cannot um, repeat a word. You cannot be repetitive. You use the same keyword all over again. You have to constantly use a different word. Also, synonyms are very important uh, to paraphrase, not to copy-paste material. So um, it's very imperative that you learn a lot of words. Now, we are at the point of previewing. In the video, I already explained what it is. So you guys already know it. It is... Um, you preview to get the type of text and the purpose of the text, which gives you focus. And that focus uh, helps you to know what to read for and how to take notes. Now, previewing is mostly done by looking at the title and the visuals and maybe the headings. In this case, this story does not have headings. So it would just be looking at this. So we see the education affect the court. So we know that it is about this man and that it is about his education of, could be, Education could be uh, the studies he did, 
but it could also be his lifelong learning process. Yeah, so from there, we already know it's about this man's life, so it will describe uh, what he has learned. Yeah, so there will be a chronology then, in a sense that it will come up with uh, years. Yeah, and chronology means that uh, that is flowing in step by step, first, then after that following, or let's say 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, year 2000, like that. Okay, now here in the previewing, there are three questions that kind of help us to dig into the story and to understand. Um, you were supposed to read the first two paragraphs only to get an idea of the text. Now, the first question, um, where is Frank McCourtney now? Okay, where is Frank McCourtney now? Just now I asked for Dean, so I go to Nadia, Nadia Janice. Nadia, good morning. Okay, no response. So um, I go to Evelyn. Yes, miss. Good morning. Can you answer number one? Mm, yes. Uh, Frank McCourt is in New York City, Lincoln Center. Yeah, he is in New York. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Okay, we go to the next question. Uh, what do you think he means by they gave me so much more than I gave them? I'm going to ask that to Nicholas William. Yes, miss. Can you answer this question, please? Number two. Yeah. Mm, the student talked him a lot about the world. Very good. Yeah. So his students. Oh. Uh, mm. The students taught him a lot about the world and himself. Yeah, very good. What do you think happened to Frank between 1949 and 1997? Ferin, good morning. Ferin, good morning, Ferin. Okay, uh, Michaela Grace. Yes, miss. Can you answer this? Good morning. Um, he taught English at Stuyvesant uh, High School and have a great successful teaching. Yeah. He had a successful teaching career. Yeah, exactly. That's what he had. Now, by answering these questions, you basically already get an idea. This guy teaches, lives in New York. He learned a lot about the world and about himself through students. So probably that is the education, as in his walk of life and what he learned throughout his life. Okay, so you had to read this and... Then we dip into the main ideas. So remember, main ideas are developed by main points. Main points are developed by details. So if we're looking at main ideas, then the development of it is main points. Main points are developed by details. That's why we have a main idea, then a, de then a main point, and then a detail. Now let's say if these years are the main ideas, main idea one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that means that we have seven body paragraphs because every body paragraph has one main idea, or one uh, sub main idea, right? So that would be the topic sentence. And then these would be the main points. But if we look at it as in one paragraph, 
then probably the main idea would be uh, uh, Frank McCord's education or learning process. And then this would be main point one, detail. Main point two, details. Main point three, details, like that. Okay, I'm just saying so you understand. Remember that the general main idea is reflected to the title and the instruction, the thesis statement. And the sub main ideas, the smaller main ideas, those are in the topic sentences and the headings. Those are per paragraph, okay? Awesome beans. Now here we are looking at the, uh, the main ideas that we got from the text. Now, the first one here is in 1934, we have Frank McCord's family returning to Ireland. Then in 1949, we've got Frank McCord returned to the United States. He himself returns to, returns to the United States. Okay, and now I'm going to type it in. Uh, in, in please check whether you got that correct. Yeah. Uh, Frank McCord begins teaching at Seward Park High School. That's what happens in 1970. Yeah, let's see what happens in 1981. Frank McCord McCord's mother dies. Very sad. 1994. And 1994, Frank McCord begins to write his book, which is inspired by his students, yeah, to write. 1996. Angela's Ashes, which is the name of his book. It hits the bookstores. It gets published. And in 1997, And then in 1997, Angela's Ashes, his book receives the Pulitzer Prize. And that is a very prestigious prize to win for a writer and to get for a book. It's amazing. Can you imagine that from his background, being poor and who he was, and then well, he makes his way and he gets inspired by his students and he ends up writing a book and he becomes super famous after writing that book, basically. So amazing. Yeah. Okay, uh, you guys got this? Now, this you need to remember because this goes back into uh, all the other information, basically. This goes back into the next page, but I cannot copy paste this. So please make sure you uh, got this correct. Now, as we're going to the next page here, 42, we are looking at the details. So we've got these events here, and now we're going to look for the details. And you have to find them. Uh, at page 36, 37, the vocabulary part, the text of the vocabulary, 36, 37, and you had to look for it in reading one. Yeah, so the first event, Frank McCourt's family mm, uh, returns to Ireland, right? Now, let me read it to you. So, um, the McCourts wanted a better life, so they returned to Ireland. Their life was still very hard. Three children died, and the family remained very poor and very hungry. That is in the first one. So the second event here, in 1949, Frank McCourt returned to the United States. Frank McCourt was 19 years old. 
when he returned to the United States and he wanted to start a new life. In 1970, uh, Frank McCord began teaching at Seward Park High School. He began teaching and using his past to connect with his students. His students loved his stories. And as he told his stories, he realized how his past affected him. In 1981, Frank McCord's mother dies. After his mother died, he realized he had no excuses not to write his memoirs. While his mother was alive, McCord chose not to write about his childhood out of respect for his mother. 1994, Frank McCord began to write his book. He struggled to write his memoirs. It was very difficult at first and he had to dig deep into his past. 1996, Angela's Ashes hit the bookstores. Frank McCord finally finished his memoirs and named it Angela's Ashes. Within weeks, it became a bestseller. And in 1997, Angela's Ashes received the Pulitzer Prize. Because the book was so good, it won a major award and a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Frank McCord became famous. So those are the details that go with these main points. Yeah. Any questions? No? Okay, cool then. We're going to go into um, making appearances, infer inferring the meaning of idioms and expressions from context. Now, who can tell me what making inferences means? I've mentioned this already many times. Uh, let me ask. Let me see. Christopher Tristan. Christopher Tristan, good morning. Yoni, Yoni, yeah. yeah, good morning, Yoni. Can you tell me what making inferences means or what an inference is? Um, yeah, let me see. What does it mean, inference? In 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 here in it's on the screen oh uh if i'm educated yes about me yeah about the meaning of something so when we make an inference what we're basically doing is we're taking facts from different positions like for example you take facts from the first paragraph the second the third and the fourth and the fifth and you're combining, you're putting them together, and from there you make a conclusion, and that is inference. So it is not the literal meaning of what is literally stated, explicitly stated, but it's implied, means the underlying meaning. You cannot literally explain that. So in order to get that, you look for a conclusion, which you get from facts. So in this case, to understand the meaning of idioms and expressions, now idioms and expressions uh, authors, writers use idioms, expressions, figurative language in order to, be, to give deeper meaning. If, for example, you want to say to your mom, mom, I love you, and you just say, yeah, mom, I love you, that is not that intense. I love you as much as the stars are in the sky or in the galaxy. Now, that would be an expression, and, and that will give a more depth, like, I love you that much, like, there's, like, so many stars in the galaxy, like, so amazing so that much i love you so using an idiom and expression of figurative language uh really really gives more intensity to the to the meaning of your message and that's why authors use that now for example here with more than 10 years of teaching experience under his belt this kind of interrogation no longer surprised him he really doesn't have anything under his belt and he's probably not even wearing a belt it's an expression which means that he has just that much experience or achieved in life, yeah? Now, what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at the idioms and expressions here. 
but we're not going to look at the meaning just as the meaning what the meaning is but in context yeah uh it says here um uh, use context of cinema the meaning write the cinema definition of the idiom or expression compare uh, the answers with another student yeah so what we're going to do is what is the meaning and the meaning in context yeah so you have to read it in context means that you're not taking taking for example throw it in my face as a separate uh, idiom or expression but you look at it what it means and looking at the context where it is used in the text so that's why you need to refer to the paragraphs that are mentioned in the parentheses okay okay number one throw it in my face I'm going to ask Jovita, Catherine. Jovita, Catherine. Yes, Miss. Okay, can you do number one for me? Show it in my face. To blame the critic. To blame. Yeah. The critic. Criticize. Criticize. Yeah. yeah. Good, 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 good. Doesn't have to be exactly the same. Uh, in a context, it would mean that, yeah, criticism, like confronting him with criticism. <clears throat> good. Forge a link. Um, I'm going. Uh -oh. I'm going to ask um, Daniela. 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 Okay, other one. Alfi Galang. Michelle Angelina. Michelle Angelina. Dandi Rama. Yes, miss. What is number two? Will or make connection? Make a connection. Yeah, very good. So make a connection. Turned out, I'm going to ask Ferrol. Yeah, miss. Can you answer number three? Yeah, miss, yeah, miss. What is turned out? To browse. To turn pages briefly without yeah. being attention. Very good. Produce a large amount. Yeah, so you really just go through it, yeah? Good. Okay, I'm gonna ask Bagus Alfin. Bagus Alfin. Yes, miss. Okay, please not do number four. 
Gimana, Miss? Sinyal saya jelek. Number four. Read or turning page. Ya. Yeah. Turn pages, looking at it briefly. So really only going through it and looking at it, but not really reading everything. Lost his wits. What does that mean? I'm going to ask Florencia. Florencia. Dia izin, Miss. Oh, right. Right, I forgot. Tegar. Tegar, no. Uh, Marcel. Gede Marcel. Oh my goodness. Bayou Mani. Yes, Miss. Can you answer number five? Number five. Uh, lost, his, lost his mind. Yeah, he lost his mind. Or you can say he went crazy. It's both correct. Right? Thank you. Good. Okay, harvesting the bounty. I'm going to ask uh, Michelle Anastasia. Yes, Miss. What's number six? Um, attaining a rich reward, struggling with it. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Okay, awesome. So we can see that idioms and expressions are used to bring deeper meaning to the message, but you cannot translate them or interpret them literally. You have to look at the implied meaning of it, okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, now we're going to go to the next cards. Oh, we still have a few. Yeah, I forgot. We set up seven, eight, and nine. Okay, let me help you out with that one. So, bubbled into the consciousness, we'd say, uh, became aware. of something slowly, became aware of something slowly, dig deep would mean work right. hard, work hard and not take the easy way, when you dig deep you're really going further, you analyze further, you don't take it at a face value or at a service, you just go a bit further. Uh, dance your own dance would mean? Yourself. Yeah, do it yourself, your own way, don't copy. Yeah, you do it yourself in your own way. You do not copy. Uh, wait. People's ideas, yeah. In the same boat means equal. Yeah, the same. That is basically what it means. Yeah. You guys have any questions about this? I don't know. I don't think so. No? Okay, awesome then. Okay, cool. Then we go to expressing opinions. This is the part where you, uh, it's important to express opinions because uh, you will learn to reason. And that is a very important aspect for you to learn. So um, we are looking in this. Uh, aspect at peel what I've already taught you um, so do you remember we have peel which is basically the point that you're making if you're expressing your opinion that could be your opinion and then we've got the e for um, 
explanation. That could be reasons to develop your opinion, right? And then we got another E for evidence mostly, which in this case can be examples, yeah? And we've got L. Yeah, so when you express opinions, it's important that you can keep up with the peel. P is the point. If you give your opinion, it can be opinion. E for explanation can be the reasons for why you have that opinion or the explanation of your point. The other E is the evidence that you would give to um, support your explanation or there can be examples to support your reasons. And the L is link. You link back to the point that you made or link back to your opinion and close your talk. Okay, Frank McCord had many obstacles in his life. What do you think was Frank McCord's greatest obstacle? Who would like to respond to this? Kevin, Kevin, can you answer this? Yeah, Kevin, Miss. Yeah, hi. Can you give me your opinion on uh, number one? Uh. Frank McCourt had many obstacles in his life. What do you think was Frank McCourt's obstacle? How did he overcome it? Uh, I don't know, miss. What do you think? You read the text, we talked about it. What do you think was his biggest obstacle? What do you think was hardest for him? Wait, miss, I will reread again. Okay, I'm going to ask you to answer number two. So you have time to answer, yeah? So you're going to answer number two. I'm going to ask Megan to answer number one. Oh, my God. Uh, the, 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 wait. Many what do you think was hardest for him in his life? What was difficult for him? When his his mother died, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that could be. Yeah. Is it how, right? did he, how did he deal with that? How did he overcome that? Um. How did he do that? By writing his memoirs. Yeah. I guess so, yes. Yeah, by writing his memoirs, I think that's, that must have been something that helped him overcome. How yeah. would your opinion, Miss? Huh? How My opinion? opinion? Uh, yeah. I, per I personally think that his greatest obstacle in life was accepting his past. Uh, so, and why? Uh, because uh, he didn't want it, he was ashamed of it, and that gave him. Uh, it made it hard for him to move forward in his life. And at one point he had to move forward in his life and it was difficult. Right. And you could see that in the fact, and one of the evidence or examples of that is, is that he um, uh, made a different past. He didn't tell honestly to people what his past was like. He was impersonating something else. And that yes. is the evidence of it, that it was so hard for him to accept that. But in the end, uh, he had to uh, make amends with it. And then when his mom died and he chose, and of the influence, I think also of his students, chose to write the memoirs. And I think that is where he had to deal with it. And eventually it turned out for good. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I really believe that it was uh, the ex his past, accepting uh, where he came from. So that was one of the biggest obstacles in his life. And that's how I would say it, using P-E-E-L. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Uh, what about you, Kevin? Number two, how did Frank McCord's students give him the courage he had been lacking to overcome his obstacles? So he felt very encouraged by his students. Did you get uh, why or how? Kevin? Uh, yeah, miss. What do you think? How would you respond to that? Um, 
by other students giving him courage uh, so that he will be more confident doing things, I guess. Yeah, that's what they did. And they did that when they asked him to tell stories about his past. They asked him to tell stories. And so he started telling stories and that's how he felt encouraged. And his students probably encouraged him even more to tell more because they were interested about it. So I think through that, he, he, he got more confidence and he learned actually to see that his past wasn't that bad or that it was okay. And, you know, learning to accept that. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, guys, expressing opinion, important. Yeah, remember that you got your pill going. Be opinionated, reason, think about things, but remember, always express your opinion respectfully. Yeah, always be polite and always be respectful and open towards other people's opinions as well. That is very important, okay? Okay, if, uh, wait, let me quickly show you our unit two schedule where we are at right now, uh, October 5th, right? So for our Zoom meeting today, we did reading one. Means for your project, you gotta focus on, on step three, researching your journal. So you did your brainstorm, use your brainstorm to research for your writing, for your essay. Your post study is going to be the activities in reading one in your ebook for reading and writing. I have not opened it yet. I will open it in a bit. And for your pre study, which is very important for next week's Zoom meeting, your pre study, please watch the video that I've already sent to you um, last Monday, uh, which is listening to and do the activities in your textbook for listening and speaking. You need to do this. So, our Zoom meeting. Uh, you will understand what we're talking about, okay? So this is a focus for now. Please follow the, uh, the guide, uh, the, the schedule. Everything is already placed in Moodle. You can find everything there. So uh, it must be clear. If there's still any question, please do not hesitate to ask me. And now I do remember because one of you, I forgot who asked me that such a good question just now. And I told you to wait that I would get there. I remember now that I didn't go there. Um, the difference between meager and poverty, that was on page 37. So we have the words meager, I go here first because otherwise I feel guilty that I haven't uh, answered that. Oh. Yeah, I also forgot. <laughs> yeah, but I suddenly remember it. So we were here. So we have the word meager that stands for poor and sparse. And then we have the word um, a poverty number eight. Uh, having little money, a few material things. Now, how is that different? Now, I will not say to you, you are poverty. You are poor. That's your state of being is you're poor. But mm -hmm. I can say, I live in poverty. I cannot say I am poverty. I am poor. My state of being is poor. But I live in poverty. I don't live in poor. I live in poverty. So poverty is more referring to uh the things you have so not much money few material things uh don't live in a good house uh, don't get good education can't get a proper job so that would be the poverty poverty is more leaning into um the material things does that make sense if i say that so poverty uh poverty in itself is also a noun but it's more the state of being extremely poor which is everything to do with that it, everything is in an insufficient amount. You don't have enough of everything. So it's more into uh, the things you do not have. And if you look at poor, uh, poor is more referring to um, uh, I am poor. It's an, poor is actually an adjective, yeah, where it refers to me, my state of being. Yeah. So the difference in the part of speech. Now, there's a difference in part of speech. Mm, okay. Sylvie is poor, so poor refers to Sylvie means it's an adjective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, poverty, poverty, poverty itself is a noun. So that this poverty is more refers to that we don't have much, whereas poor is more the state of being like I am poor. Very similar in meaning. They're just a different part of speech and they're used differently grammatically. Uh, guys, I hope that this answers your question. Yeah. I think uh, if we translate it to Indonesia, poverty mm -hmm. would, would, would mean kemiskinan. 
Okay. But would be miskin. I yeah, guess. yeah, something like that then. Yeah, different part of speech, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and that's why because they're a different part of speech, they're also used differently within a sentence. Yeah. Okay, awesome, guys. Have a great week. God bless you. I'll see you again next week. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you.